Welcome back. Um, before I'm gonna dive into the Q&A, um, and I certainly would like to start with kind of like what I think uh, unifies your approaches, Mark wanted to make a clarification before his talk. Yes, um, uh, a lot of what I talked about, like I said, is stuff I find pr profoundly disturbing. So I just wanted to clarify uh, part of it. Uh, when I talk about multipolar surveillance, there's an, there's an example today of how the resulting transparency is clearly decorrupting. And that is uh, the massive distribution of cell phones with cameras and the effect of that on bad cops. Uh, there's this increasing um, move to have cops have body cams that also uh, you know, hurts bad cops, helps good cops. Uh, but there's lots of accidents where a cop, oh, accidentally forgot to turn the body cam on or accidentally turned it off. It's the multipolar monitoring of all of the other people with cell phones combined with that that create a decorrupting transparency. So I, I want to, to just lay that out as an example of um, uh, the positive side of massively multipolar transparency. All right, thank you. Okay, then I would like to start with a little, um, <clears throat> I, th I think a little unifying theme um, where I just pulled a bunch of quotes from you guys from, from the internet. And I think like, you know, one of the main kind of like objections that I get when I talk to people about um, our framework is, well, but like, you know, wouldn't decentralization slow down global coordination that may be needed to tackle a bunch of like existential risk, right? That is one together with like, is that system even stable? You know, aren't we running or like, aren't we facing power loss? And we're, we're gonna go end up in a kind of like centralized system anyways. But this one is more like normative, right? Like isn't decentralization bad because it causes great gridlock? So I think, uh, and I'm just gonna quickly read out the quotes of you and then I'd love for you guys to comment on them. Um, basically, uh, Mark says, building the system to be in conflict with itself is a much more realistic strategy than to pursue building a unitary system that wants the right goals. While the checks and balances designed into such a system lead to a decrease in speed and efficiency, this is a positive trade-off in exchange for reduction and much more serious risks. Eric says, and I pulled this also from like a, a paper, the examples of memes controlling memes and of institutions controlling institutions also suggest that AI systems can control AI systems. And Robin says, and like a really good, I think, uh, post on overcoming bias as an answer to the vulnerable world hypothesis, but alas, central power risks central suicide, either done directly on purpose or as an indirect consequence of other broken thinking. In contrast, in a sufficiently decentralized world, when one power commits suicide, its place and resources tend to be taken by other powers who have not committed suicide. Competition and selection is a robust long-term solution to suicide in a way that centralized governance is not. So we, here we have the two themes of like gridlock can be a feature, not only a bug, and centralization could be a future filter by allowing uh, a single point of failure. Do any of you want to comment and explain your quote? Uh, yeah, um, I, think, I think that gets it across uh, rather well. Um, the, I do want to uh, bring up a historical uh, analogy to some of the current debates. Um, uh, back during the Cold War, when we were all facing the prospect of, of a potential thermonuclear war and world destruction, uh, Bertrand Russell um, uh, was making an argument that came to be known as better red than dead. Uh, the argument was that uh, the prospect of thermonuclear war and the resulting extinction is so bad that we should just avoid the Cold War by unilaterally surrendering to the Soviet Union and just letting communism take over the world so there's no longer a Cold War, um, uh, basically capitulating to total totalitarianism to avoid the conflict that would be thermonuclear war. Um, uh, a, I'm very glad that we didn't do that. And I very much want to be clear that I want us to avoid making that mistake again, even when I seem to be 
advocating things that seem to be steps in that direction. I think that the Burton Russell thing is a very good precedent. Uh, also, I don't think that living under a unitary totalitarian regime makes it less likely for massive masses of population to be destroyed by nukes. I think it makes it more likely. So many people like to pick an ideology and stick with it. It's just a fun thing to do. <laughs> and one of the standard dimensions of ideology is more versus less governance. So people like to go to the extreme, absolutely zero, or the extreme, let's govern everything. Um, I'm a PhD in formal political theory and social professor of economics, and I gotta say, the extremes don't make so much sense. The answer is in the middle. Uh, you are more familiar with those trade-offs in your world, more governance versus less, both directions risk various things that can go wrong, there's a trade-off. When we start to talk about the future, people start to imagine problems they don't see around them, and the first thing they imagine is, what do we do about this problem? And the first thing that occurs to many people is governance. Governance could fix this problem. And of course, that's true. Governance could fix the problem. It's the second level of analysis to say, yes, but if you authorize governance to claim to fix problems like that, there's a bunch of other things that could go wrong. And it's a trade-off. And I think people, when they think about the future, they said, ah, yeah, it's trade-off. Today, governance is trade-off, but these future problems are so severe, yeah, we got to be better red than dead about the future red robots. Uh, and they aren't thinking about all the other things that go wrong. So I'd say, if you think about the future and all the other things go wrong, it's still kind of a muddle in the middle. That's the way the world is. Uh, so I would like to say that the other two quotes are much better than mine. They're much more concrete, uh, uh, deep, and uh, high quality in general. Uh, I do, do, do have some other things to say uh, more recently. I'm not quite sure when that one comes from. Uh, with respect to the thermonuclear war and so on, what I would like to see is a gradual in multilateral entrenchment of some mutually acceptable system that closes off the options for some particularly horrible destructive outcomes. It's very different from trying to structure society. It's about closing off mass destruction, for example, building on that platform with, in an increasingly decentralized way as one gets to problems that are less doable. Hmm? How do you do that? Um, you mean what the systems look like technically, or how does one have a path through uh, constrained politics space that would lead people to want to do it? Yeah. Either. Uh, in 30 seconds or less. Uh, well, we'll try to get it something that's not 30 minutes, uh, but closer to 30 seconds. How is that? Maybe even on a log scale. Okay. Um, we would like to have a situation in the future such that when it seems the world is changing more rapidly, more automation than Robin would regard as credible, but this is perhaps the hard case, that decision makers are forced out of a business as usual stance and they realize they have to do something, something different in part to avoid risk of destabilizing conflict and in part to take enormous, gather, get the enormous benefits, the not, essentially non-rivalrous benefits that can come from increased productivity and AI. So there's large carrot and there is a risk stick. And what one wants to have is in that situation, a well-developed set of options that are recognized inside the relevant institutions, not necessarily at the top, but sort of plan B options that are coherent, that involve actors acting in what is clearly in their interest given the proposed actions of the other actors, and where those actions uh, include deploying, stabilizing, defensive military systems. And how one gets to the situation that I described, where actors are in a position to uh, more readily jump in a good direction than a stupid direction, is through incremental expansion of a circle of discourse in which we understand more deeply and more broadly what kinds of policies would in fact be good from many, many different points of view and stabilizing. So basically, in short, uh, develop good options, have those options be very clear and visible and on the table so that when the world gives, uh, gives the system a big kick, people are inclined to jump in the right direction. Okay, uh, while you can all get your questions ready, I would love to like nudge you um, to talk about Pareidotopia because I think that would be like a nice, um, have addition to like your last statement. So the, the term Pareto-topia is a kind of a bulky term. The concept of Pareto prefer preference, a situation that is preferred or not dispreferred uh, by all of the, the relevant actors. 
quote unquote Pareto-topia would be a state of affairs that is approximately strongly Pareto preferred by you know, approximately all of the powerful or important actors. And if in fact we can have a future in which you can have an enormous expansion of material wealth per capita uh, without necessarily changing the, the relative positions of actors who are concerned with their positional goods and status. Uh, and simultaneously uh, remove the rivalrous nature of security. So what, you know, the ultimate rivalrous <coughs> good today, today seems to be the, the, the rivalry, the dominance in a rivalry, which means in a military sense. So if there is a state of affairs that is defensively stable and everyone is a lot better off materially and they are not being crushed into some utopian shape, hence paratotopia, not utopia, then that's maybe a direction that people would like to go. And this is a very broad brushstroke concept. There's a lot that can be said in more detail about uh, what the technological infrastructure might, might look like, uh, path dependencies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Pareto-topia is consistent with many different agents in society uh, seeking a tremendous variety of different goals and uh, finding ways to voluntarily cooperate with each other, uh, each in service of the goals that they, that they have, which are different than, than others. Um, and eventually, we're going to be living in a world in which um, we're coexisting with mind architectures that are incomprehensibly different than our own. So, uh, so the idea of something beyond Pareto-topia um, uh, is, I think, unrealistic because we can't see into each other's minds, much less the minds, the, ar the, the, the minds of architectures that we haven't even built yet. Uh, the rule of voluntary interaction as the basic framework of interaction um, uh, is very robust, simple uh, sense of revealed preference that entities engage in voluntary interaction when they expect benefit and generally they achieve benefit if they're doing things for which they expect benefit. Um, so uh, this rule continues to build wealth even when we're sharing the world with mind architectures different from our own and takes into account their welfare as well as our welfare. Say I asked you how to reform medicine and you say you want people to be healthier and it for it to cost less and to take less time. I'd say, okay, but how do you propose to reform medicine? That's where I'm lost here. Uh, yes, the goals sound fine, but um, when you hear a proposal, you want to hear like some mechanism or rules, like a thing to do that you could do to, to achieve these great outcomes. Uh, we wait for the tremendous increase in automation and productivity that you think we would wait a very long time for. And we start trying to change the discussion on this by asking, uh, uh, you know, what are bottlenecks for automation? I think that one consideration has been that to date machines have not had functional hands, vision that works, or brains. And we're having machines that are having a much better approximation to functional vision systems, hands, and brains. And it's amazing we've been able to do much with automation without those. And when we get those, I think it is a substantially different game. Uh, Ravi and then me. Um, so a question I got. Loud, please, so that yeah, everyone can hear. Your multipolar world that you're talking about is, Wait, to it, it, some extent, the way things are right now. The multipolar world that you're talking about is to some extent the way things are right now, the status quo. There are many different organizations developing different AI systems for different purposes, with different architectures, with different sets of people, and those are evolving and improving in various ways. Um, but the governance it ultimately comes down to what would be prevented from happening in the world that you're talking about. And the question is, how do we... How do we decide what to prevent, and how might that be enforced? Last 
Questions to you guys. Decide who to, who goes first, not all at once. Next it would it would be a bad idea to in the Constitution declare dogs shouldn't yell too late at night and disturb their neighbors. That's just too much detail. So I, I don't think we should be making a long list of specific things that could go wrong. We should be having a general mechanism for detecting and uh, dealing with problems. That it should be at a different level of abstraction. Legal yeah, I think uh, uh, this isn't a direct answer to the question, but I think it sort of orients the, the, the system within which I would try to answer questions like that, uh, which is, to my mind, a lot of what we're wrestling here has strong analogies to the questions that James Madison wrestled with, um, that uh, the large-scale institutions, the interests, et cetera, that he was worried about are super intelligent systems that would outlive him. Uh, his basic heuristic about what to avoid was avoid, above all, a unitary concentration of power. Uh, instead, divide power as much as you can into separate entities that are then placed in opposition to each other. Um, and it's the dynamic balance that comes from that division of of power uh, and the system of opposition that uh, I think is our best route to a framework in which we can avoid a lot of the dangers. Um, so this is, uh, uh, I'd like to start with Eric. Um, the, there are um, things that can be changed when there's an abrupt disaster, and there are things that can be changed when people start to go, oh, well, that's not working. Uh, the, the example that, that, that uh, some of us saw was, you know, a long time ago, there was electronic check project, and we got to see these giant check sorting machines where someone points at that and goes, if these machines are down for six hours, we can never catch up with the physical volume of paper checks that have to be shuttled across the country. And then, of course, 9-11 happened, and the machines were down for more than six hours. And they, had, they rushed through an, an incredible change to the financial system that they could do because there had been a bunch of people preparing this and trying to get it through the legislature, and they just couldn't. And suddenly when they needed it, wow, there was a solution right there. They could go and, and, and point at whatever was convenient and decide that that was the way of truth, and off they went. And so in some sense, if big disasters happen, you know, they're, they're, what's lined up and ready for the people to decide is the way to go will be important. And, and so if this is something that would fall into that category, then how do you, is it something that, would, that you expect to fall into that category? Is it something you expect to fall into a more gradual transition? Uh, I am thinking of the category that you're describing, though not quite such a hammer blow, uh, but more of a transition that is on a short, on a decision maker's time horizon scale. Okay. Uh, if one is looking at a tremendous expansion in potential wealth per capita, a tremendous potential disruption of the military order, uh, a range of possibilities to take stabilizing moves, and all of those are new from the point of view of a decision maker's time horizon, and yet the possibilities for how to deal with them are well articulated, so to the, you know, the equivalent of track two diplomacy. Uh, there are you know, a bunch of white papers, there are sketches of agreements, et cetera then the idea isn't that you uh, reform, that you make healthcare cheaper by having a reform. It's that you have a technological pressure that can make healthcare cheaper, and people want that, and there is a plan for getting out of the way of that, in effect. It's, it's not that your, your reform is bringing it about. It's that it's responsive to an exogenous technological force. So a big push from the technological world, forcing change with, op with options for enormous mutual benefit, and for stabilizing, you know, freezing out the possibility of mutual harm. Looks like a good deal. Gee, the world is different. What do we do? Here's a plan. What do you do? Uh, you say, um, uh, do you want to sit at this nice seat at the negotiating table? It's a beautiful table, comfortable chair. Look, your peers are going to be sitting around it. Uh, and here are the briefing papers. Or do you say, what? I'm not going to deal with that and look like an idiot. Or do you try to resist something that you and other pe people in your organization think is a good idea, and you'll probably lose because other people have lined up in favor of something that is a win-win situation, broadly speaking. 
Uh, or do you, you know, take your seat at the negotiating table? I mean, what we're looking toward here potentially is a new kind of international relations based on win-win cooperation to build a community of shared future for humankind, to quote President Xi Jinping. I, I want to support the disturbing implication of your comment, which is that through most of history, uh, major changes were driven by wars and revolutions and major disasters, and people often waited till such things before they could make large changes. Yeah, that, that was the revolution, though. I mean, it's easy to see things that were driven by, by such disasters, but there were plenty that weren't. In terms of we often have large coordinated systems that we stick with until we're forced to change, and it's usually some crisis that forces it to change. And a problem, thankfully, with long peace and prosperity that we've had is that we, the analogy of software rot probably is accumulating in our legal and regulatory systems, whereby we are slowly getting more and more cruft and inflexibility as we continue with peace and prosperity. And uh, that puts us in a pretty awkward situation of um, wondering how we could make substantial changes to break out of our existing uh, rut without killing a lot of people. An extremely fast growth in automation and productivity, I think, could be quite a shock to the system. I want to introduce here the um, uh, concept of genetic takeover, um, uh, where a new system that operates differently than the existing system is able to grow and be viable within the existing system, cooperating with the existing system, until it gets big and strong enough to displace the existing system. We saw this with mainframe computers and personal computers. There was this, when I grew up in the computer industry, uh, the mainframe software was so prevalent that it would be easy to imagine that all future computing systems would be running some version of that software due to lock-in of um, the need to be compatible with legacy. Uh, instead, uh, the personal computer uh, was in a sufficiently different niche that it was not as attractive to import the logic of the legacy system. So it was able to grow a new system uh, alongside the mainframe, cooperating with the mainframe until it displaced the mainframe. I see very much that potential for crypto commerce. Um, uh, I'm very hopeful that crypto commerce can be the seeds of something like that. And once again, what I'm seeing in crypto commerce is a world building an ecosystem of much more secure software, much greater pressure to be secure, and very, very little pressure to run legacy insecure software within the new world as part of the new world. Yes, and the big point there that was uh, an image of a genetic takeover in the biological context that I just uh, still had open for like a different uh, talk that we did together. Uh, this is an image of it. If you want more information on that, uh, there's another talk that we did on that called um, AI is Civilization is Development Superintelligence at uh, the Artificial General Intelligence and Corporations meeting. So that just to that image. Okay, we had another question. Yeah, I had a question for Robin. Um, you talked just now in reply to Eric, I think, about having a specific set of rules to make sure things don't go wrong. I want to put the question to you of what should those specific rules be or how do we get to them? Uh, governance is hard. We have existing status quo governance systems. I'd say we should explore variations at the small scale first in lab trials and small field trials and only work our way up to larger trials as they succeed. So I would not propose any radical substitution for existing governance systems. I have trials that I think are worth exploring. And in the Journal of Political Philosophy, for example, I have a paper called, Shall We Vote on Values But Bet on Beliefs Where? And I propose using betting markets as a basis of a form of government. But I describe how that might look at the national level, but I don't propose mere interest in that. The obvious thing to do with any institutional proposal is to try it out in the small scales you can, in as many ways as you can, before you slowly adopt on larger scales. Okay, can I ask a question? quick follow-up? I wanted to ask, is, is this question about the design of social institutions to ensure that anything doesn't go wrong, is this like actually fundamentally different to the question of how we design a safe superintelligence? Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
think that Robin is saying that one does not design, uh, one incrementally develops and adapts. And I was going to ask uh, Markham, is it Conway's law regarding the form of software systems? Uh, do you care to comment on <coughs> what that is and how it might relate to the general architecture of future societal computational systems? Uh, good. I hadn't thought to apply it to this set of issues, but clearly... I thought you could pick, up, pick it up very rapidly and yeah. unfold the abstraction. Okay, very in good. In a minute, of course. Yeah, in a minute. Um, yeah, uh, please don't count. Um, <laughs> uh, Conway's law is, I'm not quoting quite literally, but um, an organization can only design systems whose communications structure reflects the communication structure of the organization. Um, and I've seen some very nice examples of that. Um, the... Uh, if we have a decentralized, peaceful world of many interests, including many high-tech interests who can make progress on these technologies, and they're in an economy in which there are opportunities for different services to compose and, um, and um, engage in uh, cooperative interactions with each other as just an extension of the nature of global markets, uh, then that should help facilitate uh, the gradual increase in intelligence in many places for many purposes specialized in interacting with each other because they're occurring within nodes in an ecosystem that are already pressured to specialize and collaborate. Is that essentially what you had in mind? Along those lines, uh, just a couple of comments that also fit with this. I think that the, you know, the future is constantly templating itself on the past. We don't see a, a vast reset of the pattern of relationships and, and existing things. We see incremental change where the overall structure resembles the structure of the, of the previous phase. So if what we see is, is the, the spread of automation into the world, you expect people to be to first order automating the kinds of tasks that exist. If you're entrenching governance in various ways, it's entrenching governments that already exist. If you're trying to stabilize the defensive world, you're taking different military systems and working to get them into a stance where defense really does mean defense. Uh, so let's, let's flip this around and ask a, a, another question that comes to mind. When people talk about a unipolar world, they say we're going to have uh, someone take over the world and make it uh, all uh, cooperative and nice. Well, a subtask of taking over the world is overthrowing the government of China, and perhaps China and the United States both. I think that if you had, people say, well, a super intelligent system, we'll get a super intelligent system, then we'll do this. I think a super intelligent system would recommend that you not try to do that that it's, it's, it's risky, it's dangerous, it's unlikely to get you where you want. Someone will notice you're trying and they will come and stomp on you first or, or whatever. That you're much better off essentially bribing everyone with the goodies of an abundant future uh, to, to, to want to, to have the share of, 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 of potential universal wealth that they can have if we get to a safe environment, a safe, a safe system, stabilize the existing fundamental relationships and uh, I don't know, that looks like a pretty good deal and it leads to a future that's templated on the present but upgraded in a lot of very significant ways from the point of uh, view of human beings. Just a quick degree of support, I, I've been saying for a while, I even if AI takes over all human jobs, we should probably expect to see a familiar structure of industries, professions, cities, nations even, uh, jobs broken into tasks because there's this inertia as reflected in Conway's Law, this forward thing to do will be to replace individual tasks and have them interface with other tasks through the same structure that already exists. And that inertia probably will produce a world that looks a lot like the world you know, even if it's all robots. I'm going to, uh, first of all, I agree in general with that theme, but I want to argue a radical change in governance as well, um, uh, which is one of the problems in our current frameworks of laws is that we have too few choices. Uh, if you want to create an organization, you can have, you can, you have your pick from a fixed menu of 503x. 
Um, there's many people over time who've had fantasies of if we could only create this kind of governance system, like, you know, for example, Robin with Qtarchy is a great example of a radically different governance system that has logic to it. Many of these will not work out for all the reasons that we're saying. Most mutations in biology are fatal. In the context of this world of crypto commerce uh, and, and smart contracts, we have a new framework in which we can create radical governance experiments and in which if they go wrong, many people who participated lose a lot of money, but it doesn't lead to violence. Um, so we can afford to see many experiments and many failed experiments. And with that radical experimentation, some of these will succeed brilliantly and change the world. The discovery of new working governance systems that are substantially better than anything we can conceive right now would be a tremendous addition to the wealth creating ability of the world. So just, just to add, this is, they'll agree with me, but it's, it's a really important basic point if you don't get it. Uh, you're familiar with technology and the sense that there's a vast space of possibilities for how to organize materials or starships or you know, skyscrapers, et cetera. There's just a vast space of possibilities. That same vast space fact applies to social institutions and governance institutions, which is a vast space we haven't explored. And so you should just expect, if we have a long time to explore it, we'll find lots of stuff. Yeah. And we now have a technological basis for proceeding to do that exploration and having many large-scale experiments living within those new systems of governments and governance and seeing what happens with little downside. And if you can solve the fundamental problem of stability, security and defense, experiments have smaller downsides, and I think people will be more willing to undertake them. So, Mark? I, th I think the people that are currently in power, though, have so much uh, incentive to prevent even experimentation, because uh, they want to keep the status quo, because they're on top right now. But maybe Let's the crypto commerce system would solve that, because it's like... Yeah, already happening. Right. But I think we had a question here over there, Brad. Yeah, Mark. The uh, apropos of um, your comment on police cameras and so on, mm -hmm. uh, a wonderful quote I saw recently was Orwell never imagined we'd pay for the cameras and mostly be annoyed that no one was watching us. Um, <laughs> but I want to actually, I want to actually make a contrarian point related to that, which is that we've seen the decentralization of the spreading of political information recently. We've seen the decentralization, decentralization of um, the meeting out of justice for social offenses by Twitter. Um, and these have not gone as I hope they would. Right? I, think, I think we all hoped for better when these things were decentralized. So what might that teach us about the way even decentralization, which we love, could go wrong? So often when a huge new media revolution happens, uh, new social pathologies happen uh, as people engage and interact with each other through the new medium without prior experience in what can go wrong in the new medium. Um, I think, I think yes, I think that the current dissatisfaction with it um, is important to nurture that dissatisfaction to. Um, uh, to ask questions about what are the underlying dynamics that lead these things in a bad direction. Uh, back at Xanadu, we had some analysis before all of this happened, uh, but in retrospect, I can see how naive that was. Um, but architecture of information systems does make a difference. Uh, uh, having these problems drive us to new architectural experiments that help immunize against the, the dynamics of the problems that we're currently seeing is something that just sort of natural um, uh, progress going forward. And this it can take another generation, but, is, but, but um, it has taken you know, a generation in the past. Uh, I think we just need to figure out how to um, rise above the current pathologies. Okay, we have one last question over here. That's a lot of pressure. Um, so just tacking on to what he said, I feel like, I mean, given current times, 
increasing decentralization seems to give way to increasing fragmentation. Um, one of the reasons why we're kind of talking in the abstract and we're not like setting out a set of rules that we should follow is because there aren't common values across the board for everything. And you talked about using AI as a tool for coordination. And yes, sometimes coordination is stifled by lack of tools, but sometimes people don't want to coordinate. And so how do you, I, th I think this is very utopian and idealized because you'll have a multipolar world where biases and discrimination is amplified and you will, and that doesn't seem ideal to me. Um, and that seems really hard to kind of why does, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, why would a multipolar world amplify bias and discrimination more than a unipolar world would? I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not proposing, I'm not saying that a unipolar world is better. I'm saying that how do you reconcile um, increased fragmentation that would result? Mm -hmm. So the, pr the, pr the problem, and also not even sorry, not even that, but also just different truths. So different values is one thing, and we've already seen it. But people have very different notions of truths that should be very basic, fundamental facts that are no longer yeah. prevalent. So the, which to, is terrifying. So to my mind, the problem is not. I think you lost your mic for a few years. Okay, so, uh, I, sorry. Does, does somebody? No, 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 okay. Okay. Say what you want to say, okay. But also okay. 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 Um, the problem is not that there are many, many different ideas. That there's a tremendous number of different competing ideas. The problem is that these ideas are not put in opposition with each other. That they're not leading to productive argument and debate. Where the and this is where architecture of information systems comes in. This is part of what we were trying to achieve with Xanadu. What Robin was trying to achieve with Link Text and which uh, Idea Futures also helps with, is where different ideas about the world can be put into productive argument with each other so the people observing the argument have more data about how these ideas look when contrasted with the other ideas. The architecture of the web was a disaster from that point of view. Um, oh, brave new world that has such people in it. If we continue with the world with the kind of people you see around you and that you are and that I am, even if our technology empowers us to the maximal degree, you know, sometimes we want to fight. <laughs> sometimes we don't want to long gone. Sometimes we want to be deluded. That's the kind of creatures we are. Maybe the future will displace us with better creatures. <laughs> I don't know if you want that or not, but as long as we are the creatures we are, we will continue to have those failings. If, if there's a married couple who want to break up, you can be a counselor, you can help them with everything they can, and if they want to break up, they'll break up. That's it. I would just like to say that the question we should be asking ourselves isn't, will the future work? Uh, will will certain, certain moves solve our problems? But rather, in the range of futures that could work, aiming toward those, what are the preconditions that would be necessary or attractive or give us better odds and to work toward those. It's not a question of odds, it's a question of what is the best investment of our effort moving forward as we take steps and then reassess our next steps. All right, I think that's a beautiful way of ending this evening. Thank you.